Section 06 of From the Easy Chair, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From the Easy Chair, Volume 1, by George William Curtis. Section 06. Dickens Reading, 1867. When, here and after, some chance traveller picks up this odd number of an, of an old magazine and opens to this very page. Let him know that the evening of Dickens's first reading in New York was bright with moonlight, veiled in a soft grey snow cloud. The crowd at the entrance was not large. The speculators and tickets were not troublesome, because all the tickets had been long sold. The police, as usual, were polite and efficient, and going up the steep staircase, and passing through the single door. We were all quietly and pleasantly seated by eight o'clock. The floor of Steinway Hall is level, so that the audience is lost to itself. But it was easy for all of us to perceive, by scanning our neighbors, that we were a very fine body of people. At least everybody who was present said so. We all remarked that the intelligence and distinction of the city were present, and that it must be extremely gratifying to Mr. Dickens to be welcomed by the most intellectual and appreciative audience that could be assembled in New York. The details of the arrangement upon the platform, the screen behind, the hidden lights above and below, and the stiff little table with the water bottle, are familiar. But as we all sat looking at them, and at the variously splendid toilets that rustled in, and fluttered, and finally settled, it was not possible to escape the great thought that in a few moments we should see at that queer, stiff table the creator of Sam Weller and Oliver Twist, and McCowper and Dick Sviller, the rest of the endless, marvelous company, the greatest storyteller since Scott, one of the most famous names in literature since Fielding. When he was here before Carlyle growled in past and present about Schnauzpiel, the distinguished novelist, and there were some who laughed, but the laugh has passed by. Look, there is a man who looks like somebody's own man, who scruffles across the stage and turns up a burner or two, and he is scarcely out of the way when there he comes rapidly in full evening dress with a heavy watch chain and a nosegay in his buttonhole, the world's own man. His reception was sober. The whole audience clapped its gloved hands. Not a heel, not a cane mingled with the sound, not a solitary voice. It was a very muffled cordiality, an enthusiasm in kid gloves. The easy chair, for one, longed to rise and shout. Heaven has given us voices, brethren, with which to welcome and salute our friends. And if ever a long, long cheer should have rung from the heart, it was when the man who has done so much for all of us stood before us. But it was useless. The steady clapping was prolonged, and Dickers stood calmly, bowing easily once or twice, and waiting with the air of one ready to begin business. The instant there was silence, he did begin. Ladies and gentlemen, I am to have the honor of reading to you this evening, the trial, scene from Pickwick, and a Christmas carol in a prelude and three scenes. Scene first, Marley's ghost. Marley was dead, to begin with. These words or words very similar were spoken in a husky voice, not remarkable in any way, and with the English cadence in articulation, a rising inflection at the end of every few words, they were spoken with perfect simplicity, and the introductory description was read with good sense, and conveyed a fine relish upon the reader's part of the things described. There was nothing formal, no effort of any kind. The left hand held the book, the right hand moved continually slightly indicating the action described as of putting on a muffler, or whatever it might be. But the moment Scrooge spoke, the drama began. Every character was individualized by the voice and by a slight change of expression. But the reader stood perfectly still, and the instant transition of the voice from the dramatic to the descriptive tone was unfailing and extraordinary. This was perfection of art. Nor was the evenness of the variety less striking. Every character was indicated with the same felicity. Of course, the previous image in the hearer's mind must be considered in estimating the effect. 
the reader does not create the character the writer has done that and now he refreshes it into unwonted vividness as when a wet sponge is passed over an old picture scrooge and tiny tim and sam weller and his wonderful father and sergeant buzfuz and justice starlay have an intenser reality and vitality than before as the reading advances the spell becomes more entrancing the mind and heart answer instantly to every tone and look of the reader in a passionate outburst as in bob cratchit's wail for his lost little boy or in scrooge's prayer to be allowed to repent the whole scene lives and throbs before you and when in the great trial of vardell against pickwick the thick fat voice of the elder weller wheezes from the gallery put it down with a wee me laird put it down with a wee you turn to look for the gallery and behold the benevolent parent through all there is a striking sense of reserved power and of absolute mastery of the art there is no straining for points no exaggeration no extravagance but an instinctive and adequate outlay of means for every effect and a complete preservation of personal dignity throughout the enjoyment is sincere and unique and when the young gentleman before us remarks to the flossy young woman at his side that any clever actor can do the things as well we congratulate him inwardly upon his experience of the theatre perhaps also the flossy young woman is of opinion that any clever author can write as well as this reader there is a serious drawback to the first evening's enjoyment however and that is that fully a third of those present hear very imperfectly nothing can surpass the air of mingled indignation chagrin and disappointment with which a severe lady just behind declares that she did not hear a word and adds caustically that the spectacle alone is hardly worth the money not worth the money dear madam the easy chair would willingly pay more than the price of admission merely to see him and just as he is thinking so another friend leans forward and says in a decided tone of utter disappointment just let me take your glass will you i can't hear a word but i should like to see how the man looks as the easy chair passes out of the door he encounters mr and mrs sealskin sailing smoothly and silently out how delightful exclaims the innocent and unwary chair didn't hear a word says mr sealskin sententiously and without pausing in his course and madam upon his arm raises her eyebrows and looks emphatically not a word so the easy chair gradually discovers that there has been a very wide and lamentable disappointment and that a large part of the throng has been tantalized through the evening in the vain effort to hear catching a few words and losing the point of the joke no wonder they are very sober and sail out of the hall very steadily with an air of thinking that they have been victims but also with the plain wish to think as well of mr charles dickens as circumstances will allow still they evidently hold him upon the whole responsible just as the audience assembled to hear a lecture and obliged to go unlectured away holds the lecturer chafing in a snowbank upon the railroad fifty miles away responsible for its disappointment it is pleasant for the sealskins to read as the easy chair did the next morning in the ever voracious and independent press that mr dickens's voice is heard with ease in every part of the hall but let them feel as they may those who did not hear are sure to go again and if they hear the next time again and again let the future reader of this odd number of a magazine learn further that such was the popular eagerness to attend these readings that people gathered before light to stand in the line of the ticket office one historic boy is said to have passed the night in the cold waiting for the opening of the office and to have sold his prize for thirty dollars in gold to a southerner another person was offered twenty dollars for his place in the line with merely a chance of getting a ticket when his turn came at the office the interest was unabated to the end and under the personal spell of the enchanter that old ill feeling towards the author of american notes and the creator of chuzzlewit melted away and why not do we not all know our yankee brother of whom dickens told us who has a huge note of interrogation in each eye and can we blame the englishman for using his own eyes is not that silent traveller whom he saw still to be seen in every train sucking the great ivory head of his cane and taking it out occasionally 
and looking at it to see how it's getting on if we had been a little angry with lemuel gulliver or robinson crusoe could our anger have survived hearing one of them tell his story of lilliput or the other tale of the solitary island after his little winter tour dickens returned to new york to take leave of the american public on the saturday evening before the final reading the newspaper fraternity gave him a dinner at delmonico's which was then at the corner of fifth avenue and fourteenth street formerly the hospitable house of moses h grinnell at this dinner mr greeley presided and that the bland and eccentric teetotaler who was not supposed to be versed in what carlyle called the tea table properties should take the chair at a dinner to so roistering a blade within discreet limits and so skilled an artist of all kinds of beverages as dickens was a stroke of extravaganza in his own way the dinner was in every way memorable and delightful but the enjoyment was sobered by the illness of the guest from one of the attacks which as was known soon afterwards foretold the speedy end it was indeed doubtful if he could appear but after an hour he came limping slowly into the room on the arm of mr greeley in his speech with great delicacy and feeling dickens alluded to some possible misunderstanding now forever vanished between him and his hosts and declared his purpose of publicly recognizing that fact in future editions of his works his words were greeted with great enthusiasm and on the following monday evening he read at steinway hall for the last time in this country and sailed on wednesday he was still very lame but he read with unusual vigor and with deep feeling as he ended and slowly limped away the applause was prodigious and the whole audience rose and stood waiting reaching the steps of the platform he paused and turned towards the hall then after a moment he came slowly and painfully back again and with a pale face and evidently profoundly moved he gazed at the vast audience the hall was hushed and in a voice firm but full of pathos he spoke a few words of farewell i shall never recall you he said as a mere public audience but rather as a host of personal friends and ever with the greatest gratitude tenderness and consideration god bless you and god bless the land in which i leave you the great audience waited respectfully wishfully watching him as he slowly withdrew the faithful dolby his friend and manager helped him down the steps for a moment he turned and looked at the crowded hall it was full of hearts responding to his own there was a common consciousness that it was a last parting and his fervid benediction was silently reciprocated then the door closed behind him end of section zero six recording by april six zero nine zero california united states of america